Good morning. Thanks very much for dragging your asses out, mate. Um, right, what I've got is a, a, a short three and a half minute video. <laughs> Right, there we go, that gives you uh, a rough idea of what Mountain Rescue is a little bit about. Okay, we're on. Chris Sterrett, that's me, registered nurse, emergency nurse practitioner and non-medical prescriber, um, and member of Loch Harbour Mountain Rescue team. Picture outside my front door, obviously I'm a nurse so I get paid that much money. <laughs> yeah, we do a bit of swift water rescue but I do it looking stupid. Um, I also run this company called Muddy Medics. Okay, I don't know if you can tell by my accent, but I'm Scottish and some of you might not be. So I'm going to talk in words that you might not understand, so I've got a few Scottish translations. We, to me, is small. Ben is a mountain. Burn is a stream. Corrie is a mountain bowl. 
Glen is a valley, a bealach is a mountain saddle. Bleder is what I'm doing right now. A burach is what I get myself into a lot. And a sprachel is a scramble or a wander through the heather. And there's me and a sprachel. Okay, Loch Arbor Mountain Rescue Team, this is our patch. Um, as you can see, to the north of us is um, Cairngorm Mountain Rescue Team, Mr. Steer, and to the south of us is Glencoe Mountain Rescue Team, Mr. Ellis, and uh, my colleague in the audience, who's remaining very silent. I'm getting grateful for that. Thanks, Ian. Um, uh, keep on wondering, son. <laughs> right, the people that help us in Mountain Rescue, because we're not uh, we're not alone. We've got Scottish Search and Rescue Dog Association, HMS Granite, these guys, the RNLI, and these guys, BASP. I thought I'd give them a shout too, as soon as they don't get one very often. Okay, so, Sarda, here we go. Um, as you can see, up here, that's an American rescue dog. He's looking cool, but not very functional. <laughs> um, and down here we've got Tara who's affiliated to our rescue team and is actually accredited with quite a few finds uh, in Scotland and avalanches. She's a, she's a great dog, she's now retired but um, is being superseded. Right, okay, so I thought I'd uh, keep these guys in. They've recently retired, uh, these yellow airframes, you'll not see much of them unless you're down in England. But they, they were our mainstay in mountain rescue for many a year along with these guys. These guys you'll still see flying around. Supposedly until next April, but probably a bit longer. The reason that they're being phased out is 40 years of hard labour takes its toll. And that's what happens to them. They crash. And that's a happy survivor. I'm proud to say, well, I can't judge it by time, but I think he's still alive. Uh, and that's what happens. This was on Simon's patch. They decided to uh, create a new bothy up in Schnechter. And it also happens to the Navy, so we had to give them a shout. And that's what happens. Who rescues the rescuers? Well, the Chinooks do. Okay, so now we're left with these guys in the Coast Guard. Um, the, the helicopter down here is the Augusta Westland 189. Uh, we were supposed to have it in April of this year. Um, doesn't look like we're going to get it at all. And I'll leave Simon to, to talk about that. But the one the, the, the one on top, the S92 is the one that's currently in service. There's two in Inverness um, and they're currently the ones that are the first line for mountain rescue in Scotland. Okay, the RNLI, we, we work um, in unison with them. We, they give us a lift to the, some of the small aisles. Should the, should the helicopter not be available? So we do regularly training with them. Um, and these guys in the ski patrol, we work with them. They are the guys on the hill who are first on scene for skiers. If they're in a precarious situation that they need the assistance of a uh, mountain rescue team, then we'll go and assist them. And here's some of these guys in action. And this is an interesting picture because this incorporates everybody here, as you can see. Um, this is a mountain rescue team member, that's a ski patroller, and we're getting lowered off uh, the summit of uh, Anak Moor to do a rescue on the climbing face and the east face, and we're assisted by our search and rescue colleagues in the military. Okay, so when did it all begin? As BT alluded to earlier, Donald Duff, he was a doctor, a pioneer of Scottish mountain rescue, an inventor, an author and leader of the Loch Harbour Mountain Rescue Team. He was also an officer in the Royal Army Medical Corps. And indeed, by all accounts, he was a gentleman. Um, a lot of his are in mountain rescue. Okay, so everybody loves a volunteer and here's some recent pics from Cairngorm team. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, the, these are the guys. This is the Duff Stretcher. Uh, I think that still exists, and uh, funnily enough, Mick Ty's got it. Okay, so how do we do? Well, summer colleagues, what have we got in summer? We've got the infamous Free Peaks Challengers. God bless them all. 
the reason a lot of money for charity. Unfortunately, not much of it's for mountain rescue, which they call out regularly. <laughs> We've got the mountain bikers, uh, a big area locally, both uh, in all three patches, really. Mountain biking is becoming much more popular and the, the nature of mountain biking is becoming more remote. So we are getting more shouts for these guys. The Ben Nevis, and I've put an exclamation tourist path because we're not allowed to call it a tourist path. We're supposed to call it a mountain path. Unfortunately, tourists don't appreciate that it is a mountain quite often get lost. We've got some overdue walkers, um, which we get called out for. And then, of course, we've got these guys, the Hell Are We tribe. They're the ones that phone up and say, where the hell are we? <laughs> then they've got their Glasgow cousins. They're called the uh, Fukawi. <laughs> okay, so where are we now? Well, pretty similar. Uh, the McInnes Mark VI, which is that one there. We can still do the same things that Donald Duff was doing back in the day. Uh, we do some more arduous type of rescues in the winter, and these are just some uh, sexy pics, because Karen, Karen Gore McGlencoe won't have any of these. Okay, here's a classic picture of uh, stirrup in action. Remember that word I told you earlier? Does anybody remember it? Something that I often find myself in, I said. Yeah, that's me in a burra. <laughs> this is a guy who had fallen. Um, and broke his pelvis. Okay, and that's how we get rid of him. Okay, winter rescues. Winter rescues are a bit more gnarly, serious, and um, cold. As you can see from these guys, they're hating it. Uh, that's a winter rescue in the summit of Ben Nevis. That summit rope that you can see there is in the summit shelter anybody who's been to the uh, top of ben nevis will see the summit shelter what a lot of people don't realize is that there's rescue equipment underneath the base of the shelter uh -huh. and here's just some pictures of us coming up this is a classic um, pictures of how rescue doesn't always conform to what you read in pre-hospital care manuals that sometimes you just have to uh, scoop and run this guy was hanging off the edge of two-step corner uh, with a broken ankle. There was no time for sexy medicine. He just had to get slung and pulled out. And there he is, unceremoniously getting dragged on the hill. He did, however, have 10 milligrams of morphine and uh, who was slinted, so we weren't that bad. And then once we're on the summit, nicely packaged, we can call them for a helicopter and hopefully they'll come and rescue us. Okay, a couple of scenarios now. A male falling over a waterfall with multiple injuries. That's actually quite in depth to some of the information we get when we get a call out. Sometimes we don't even get that much. So what happened? Well, in this instance, Coast Guard Rescue 100 picked up two medics. Both of them were emergency department nurses. I just thought we'd get that in for you doctors. <laughs> uh, they were unable to locate the casualty from the air recon, so we did a fly around. This is actually the area where the rescue was. We did, we did a, a, a fly around them and we couldn't locate them initially. So the, the medics were dropped off and we basically got dropped off at the top here and made our way down the side and just did a wee sweep down. And there's a picture of Rescue 100. So Rescue 100, uh, 100 hover taxi down the mountain river while both land-based medics search on foot. And eventually, we located him at the uh, base of a waterfall in a, quite a steep gully, which is why we couldn't see him initially. The history from his climbing partner, this now gets a bit more worrying, is that he fell 20 metres head first into the waterfall, landing with his head underwater, and he was unresponsive initially. That's bound to make you squeak a little, isn't it? Okay, so that's what we got to when we were on the scene. And that's him getting packaged. As you can see, we're it's still in the waterfall, but uh, we've got him out. It turned out that uh, when his mate had pulled his head out of the water and he was actually able to spontaneously ventilate, thankfully. Okay, so his primary and secondary survey indicated that he had an open head injury, a pelvic fracture and a compound right thumb. So all good in the end. Avalanche. 
Okay. Yeah, this is uh, a kind of common stay in winter. We tend to deal with a few avalanches and um, we get the assistance of many of the agencies involved and our local teams as well. So usually we won't do our, um, these solely as La Harbour Mountain Rescue Team. We'll do them with our colleagues from Cairngorm and Glencoe and wider afield, in fact, they'll come. Okay, so nice, clear, crystal clear day. Doesn't look too bad there, does it? Okay, three aspirant guides heading for a day's climbing on the north face of Ben Nevis. Scottish Avalanche Information Service said it was a category three day, so it's considerable, but it's a bright, clear, cold day. There was a cornice collapse, number three gully. One member of the party was spat out during the avalanche and calls for the MRT, and he begins what we call a hasty search. Interestingly, none of these aspirant guides had transceivers. Rescue 137 brings RAF mountain rescue teams to assist when they were mobilised. Their mountain rescue teams are in the same base, so it made sense to bring them along. And uh, probing begins along the tip site, as you can see here. This is a probe line. The bodies were located at the foot of the avalanche spill in the Lochins. These are the Lochins here. As you can see, the ice has cracked on the Lochins, which is an indicator that the avalanche got that far. Both victims were pronounced life extinct by the team doctor due to catastrophic trauma. And there's a picture of the guys getting dug out. Okay. So, it's not all doom and gloom really. Uh, Scotland's a beautiful place and we all like to do these things. Had to get that one in. I was paid to do it. Okay. There's, there's me looking remarkably humped as I usually am on a climb. There's Donald who is uh, another nurse practitioner in A and E with me, who's also the deputy leader of Loch Harbour Mountain Rescue Team. Yeah, that's not me. And that's another local guy. So we do get, um, you know, it's a fun place to be. Don't be scared. You're not always going to get avalanched unless you're stupid. Okay, this is a very rare picture. Rare in many ways. Rare because uh, BT's smiling. <laughs> rare because she looks reasonably happy. And the reason for that is because she thought I was going to present her with that airway training mannequin. <laughs> okay guys, thanks very much. That was just a quick heads up of uh, Loch Arbor Mountain Rescue Team, Mountain Rescue generally in Scotland. I think Simon will probably talk a bit more about that shortly. Um, and I'll hand you back over to PT. Uh. Thanks very much, Chris. Well, I think we'll take um, questions at the end. Simon on. Right, uh, good morning, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Simon. Uh, as was said, I'm, I'm, I've got two roles really. One is that I'm a member of the Kilmgorn Mountain Rescue Team, um, and the other is that I've got a role as a Chairman of Scotch Mountain Rescue. Um, so, what that is is the national representative body for um, for mountain rescue, and uh, strictly speaking, that's a bit like being the kind of unwilling caliph of the assorted tribes of the Taliban. Just uh, the, all of the, the teams in Scotland are very, very individualised. So the guys have been very quiet so far about their status, but I, I've got to say to you that you are in the presence of some mountain rescue legends. Um, first of all, we've got Chris. He's from the Glencoe team. Um, just we've also got Ian from the Glencoe team. You'll hear noise every now and then. It's, uh, it's what he does. Um, the important thing about the Glencoe team to remember before I get into any of this is they are the hardest team in Scotland. Pure mentalists. They uh, they're actually barely beyond feral, and uh, they live on a diet of uh, bark and uh, raw mints most of the time. Uh, Usually what we do is we try and flank them with a couple of adults, so uh, what we've got here is we've got uh, BT and uh, Chris Hubel from the Loch Arbor Mountain Rescue Team. Uh, it's called the Loch Arbor Mountain Rescue Team because they can't spell Ben Nevis, but uh, <laughs> just so we're all clear about it, Loch Arbor are the busiest team in Scotland. 
absolutely remarkable. They've done something like 123, 124. The number keeps going. It could be going up as we speak. Uh, rescues this year, so way busier than anybody else. They do about one and a half times the number of uh, corrects that anybody else does. And like I say, I'm from the Kelgornbank rescue team, so just so we're clear, it's the best <laughs> rescue team in Scotland. So get it up, yes. So, so the, the deal with uh, Mink Rescue in Scotland is basically it's a voluntary service. Um, and, uh, and so the people that, uh, that do Mink Rescue uh, don't get paid. And uh, we do it pretty well any time, any hour, any weather, etc. Um, I wasn't feeling too good about that actually at 20 to 1 this morning, I have to say. So uh, Scottish Mink Rescue, um, it's got its roots back, as we said, in the days of people wearing tweed and flat caps. Um, that was kind of uh, around the kind of, strictly speaking, you could say it's around the kind of 20s, 30s, 40s really, but, but actually the earliest instances of actual mountain rescues go back to the late 1800s, and the very first described instance of a mountain rescue that I've come across goes back to 1750, when there was a, a, a major was... Um, was uh, avalanched in the Cairngorms, so um, you know there's quite a history of mountain rescue. But this is the kind of the old style stuff that uh, people used to used to wear. Once we get into the 70s, um, it became de rigueur that everybody had to wear tartan shirts. Um, I've maintained that tradition, whereas I can see my colleagues have moved on. But uh, so tartan shirts, um, tweed breeches, and uh, uh, some very, very bad hairdos were very much the, the case. That's where you start to get into mountain rescue becoming a much more kind of formed uh, environment. And then after that, we get into all shopping in the same place. And uh, the Kelm Gorm team all wear the same colour jacket. Um, just so you notice, uh, the, uh, the Loch Harbour guys aspire to it so much that one of their team members has also bought one of these jackets so you can pretend to be a Kelm Gorm team member. <laughs> and. Uh, so we do this because on a bad night, uh, it's actually handy to be able to grab somebody in a yellow jacket. Um, hopefully you grab the right person. There are other yellow jackets available. We work for the police, essentially. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the highest, um, the highest statement that's been taken. So the guy in the yellow jacket was a police officer, and he was interviewing this poor soul who came across a body at 4 o'clock in the morning on, um, on top of Cairngorm. Uh, get your lucky white heather here. It's not the way you want to wake up. So. He, um, he ended up with this statement being taken up there. So we work for the police. Um, when we're doing a rescue, you end up with uh, a control room. And uh, one of the key skills in mountain rescue is to learn how to point in an authoritative manner at a map, as you can see there. Now that, that's something that you only really get as you get into team leadership. Um, as you'll see, Chris, he's, he's got quite a red eye because he's still working towards it. It just keeps getting himself in the wrong place. So you've got to point at the map. That's okay. So uh, we don't let BT point at anything because he's naturally drawn towards people's backsides and points at them. So, uh, there's a total of 27 teams in, in Scotland. Um, they all love each other dearly. And uh, there's about a thousand volunteers who love themselves. And we do about 600 incidents. Uh, those incidents are all sorts of variety of incidents. And I'll come into some of the kind of, uh, some, of some of the drift that some people might say is happening in the, in the world of mountain rescue. Um, Key point here, though, is that the government funding that is available is a, a massive £312,000 for all of those teams and all of those uh, incidents. So um, our message, I suppose, at the moment would be that they're getting it pretty damn cheap. In the olden days, uh, personal gear to kit out somebody used to cost about 238 uh, um, quid. Um, the, uh, the jibe was being made there that this, this actually is what Cairngorm were wearing. Uh, we have moved on, as you've seen, we've all got yellow jackets. Um, Loch Harbour, you'll still see some people walking around in stuff like this, and Glencoe, you won't because they've usually eaten it. <laughs> this is the more kind of modern stuff, so it costs you about three and a half grand for somebody to be equipped, and that, that's actually what people would be wearing as well um, if they're a climber nowadays, to be quite honest, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the stuff that people would be wearing. So, well, I find from having been uh, a kind of young climber coming up here, it's quite strange if you see somewhere like the Ben Car Park. It's like a fashion show now. It used to look like it was a, a collective of tramps, but now it's much more like a kind of uh, high fashion thing with very functional clothing. And that's brought with it um, a whole load of issues as well, not least trying to work out which jacket's going to match with what. Because of the way the funding works, teams uh, operate in different ways um, and they try and gain funding. Uh, Loch Harbour uh, whine incessantly on Facebook. 
uh, Kilgorm, uh, uh, crawl up the asses of the nearest uh, distiller of malt whiskey that we can find and get them to sponsor us. So everyone's actually trying to work really hard to get money, basically. And one of the things that the Kilgorm team do, particularly because we have the looks to allow us to do it, is we do a lot of stuff on the telly. You, you won't see quite so much happening around Loch Harbour. With Scottish Mountain Rescue, um, as you can see, there's a whole range of different coloured jackets here. This, this proves that we're a, a very happy family who value each other's different coloured jackets. What we tend to do is we, uh, we, we try to provide quite a bit of training. Interestingly, the training is predominantly provided by the people f who come from the, the, the larger mountain teams who do stuff on uh, things like uh, avalanches. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually very odd. I'm still not quite sure what's happening here. It's some <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but uh, BT says it's absolutely acceptable. Um, and this, is, uh, this is tied into the casualty care certificate that BT oversees. Key thing with that is that, as uh, Chris was saying, gives us a license to, to use uh, some pretty heavy end drugs um, because we're the only people that will be available to do it. We also do uh, a lot of rigging work, uh, and this is to try and standardize systems for people lowering um, and pulling up stretches and such things. And I've got to say, I think that's been one of the big things for Scotch Mountain Rescue has been to provide national courses that um, uh, even in England they don't actually do that, so it's pretty positive. In terms of point Chris was making, just wanted to go through some of the good ways to hurt yourself. Um, we've got a, a country where we seem to be pushing the whole idea of using the outdoors as a, a place to dot about, so people go walking and get themselves lost. Uh, people go doing easier climbs and, uh, and fall off them. Uh, people do hard climbs and people doing hard climbs don't tend to get as hard as people doing easier climbs because they don't hit as much when they, when they wing off. Um, however, some of the people doing hard climbs are technically really, really good at doing hard stuff and then manage to get themselves lost on the walking bit because they don't do quite so much of that. Um, we actually have some quite good ice climbing in, uh, in Scotland uh, and this, uh, this picture is a, a route that was actually done a couple of years ago, uh, eventually freed. It's, um, it's basically like a kind of ice sewer pipe. It's, it's totally hollow inside and extremely dangerous and scary. Um, we've also got a lot of uh, extreme skiing going on, so uh, we've now had quite a few incidents in this quarry of um, people falling off uh, by... I'm just going to show you. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Jacob's Ladder. That's a kind of popular Invertacoma's extreme ski run, but it actually turns into a black bump run, to be honest with you, um, by the end of the season. But if you do lose it um, up kind of here, uh, and there's a bit more kind of rocks and stuff down here, then you're pretty stuffed by the time you, you hit it. Um, there's also a run comes down here, across, and then drops into there. That run um, has seen a couple of fatalities now, because as you can see, it's good while you're on the white snowy bit, but if you blow it on the snowy bit and uh, fall over the big black kind of gravity heavy um, rocky bit, then you're going to be badly hurt. Uh, we get quite a bit of touring taking place. Uh, I think ourselves and uh, Glen Cove have both been getting quite concerned about um, the rise of the Invertacoma side country skier in, uh, in Scotland. There isn't really a side country in, in Scotland. The second you start going off the piste, you're into pretty well kind of untamed territory. And if you uh, start making mistakes, then it can get very tricky. And the biggest mistake is usually navigation. And we've all got this issue with mountain bikers, so we talk about non-mountain incidents. Uh, this summer I had to go and get uh, three mountain bikers less than 100 feet below the uh, summit of Mugdui, which is the second highest mountain in Scotland, which is a bit less high than uh, the highest mountain, which is of course in Loch Harbour, but it's higher than any of the mountains that are in Glencoe. So, um, <laughs> but the point is that, uh, I mean, there's no rivalry, don't, don't get me clear. I mean, these guys know where they stand, so. Um, and the other key thing to bear in mind is just, uh, um, uh, I suppose, an interesting aspect about the weather. The picture on the uh, left was taken in September, and the picture on the right was taken in June. We're still not quite sure about uh, um, what Hamish is doing here. He does go by the name Lars Thrust when he does some of his, um, his work with Swedish porn industry, but... Uh, <laughs> The, the deal here is, is that winter basically it can last for pretty well half a year. So, in terms of the activities that mountain rescue teams do, uh, one of the things we do is we lower people, as Chris was showing you. Uh, we do a lot of walking in lines. We're very good at walking in lines. Ian actually should be walking in a line today. He should be walking in a line looking for someone that's not found, but he's too bloody lazy to do it. So the rest of his team will be walking in lines across places. 
Uh, this is a biggie for us nowadays, I think for all of us, is having to go down shitty ground that nobody should actually be on. And part of the reason for that is tied up with navigation, GPSs, and people saying, I think I can get down here, and taking shortcuts and stuff. And they take these really horrible falls down, slippery, greasy, nasty stuff with multi-trauma. Uh, and uh, that ends up with, well, multi-trauma quite often in these situations end up with kind of multi-dead. Uh, Another thing that we've, uh, I was talking to somebody about yesterday, that um, we get a lot of missing persons, but we don't know they're missing. And one of the things that happens to all of the teams is this is a fella who um, had uh, gone up to camp at the base of that waterfall behind uh, that you can see. Um, the, uh, the police officer that had spoken to him said it was a view to die for, and he quite literally found that out. He, he died of hypothermia on uh, midsummers. Uh, we went and got him in September. Nobody knew he was missing, and the reason is that he was one of the many people who comes up from down south. is reported missing down south, but nobody knows who are going to the north. So we quite often find these people that have been around for a few months um, and aren't in particularly good shape. But one of the things we do do is we, we, we take folk back to their, their relics, and uh, it's not a particularly pleasant task, but it's one of the things we do, and it's, it's valid. Um, there's a bit of action tends to happen around uh, aircraft. This is a Cessna that went into the top of uh, Cairngorm. The, the pilot is actually just below the map there. Uh, nasty thing obviously with aircraft is you don't know how many bits you're going to be dealing with either of the aircraft or the person. The other thing is they don't follow paths ever. Um, we've also got, this is, uh, I was saying to somebody earlier about the glider shot. This is, uh, this is what happens when a 68-year-old uh, flies a glider. Um, you can see that the big issue there was that we needed to get hold of some wire cutters uh, just in there to actually cut the guy out of his uh, airframe. And the thing that's always amazed me is just over here, so you can see just there, I can't understand why Hamish, this is porno Hamish, is doing calisthenics in the corner for no reason. And the other thing we get is low-level searches. The, the teams you have before you here aren't dead into low-level searches. Uh, the reason is that they need people that can operate on the mountains and um, they're not into this idea and quite so much of doing lots of those level searches. But if it's your mum or your dad that's gone missing from a care home, then you'd want somebody to go looking for them. And uh, so we all do do it. And then finally, sometimes we do really stupid stuff like uh, go into boats. Um, and this is searching in the margins. I've just realised, actually, I have to say this to both Glencoe and to Loch Arbors, we haven't found this guy yet. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's a guy who went messing up at Lagan, so, uh, so he's now, what are they? It's about eight years that we haven't found him for yet. So I think hope is beginning to fade. Um, in terms of the things we do, um, first thing, toys. Uh, so Chris showed a couple of things. So the, the trusty thing that we have, we all use Land Rovers. Uh, as you can see, the important thing, as will always be seen by people involved in Mountain Rescue, a Land Rover always requires to be driven in a kind of splishy, splashy, muddy sort of way. There's, uh, there's actually a metalled road within three feet of this picture, but you would never do that. However, this is a relatively new member of the team, and as you get more proficient, you learn to switch on the uh, blue lights, have the siren, and then try and get a really big splash that goes right up into the stretcher rack. And that's the kind of image you're looking to really provide. It, it serves no purpose, by the way, at all, but it does look dramatic. The other thing that everyone thinks works all the time, and I've done the same as Chris, I've not got a lot of pictures of the new aircraft, um, but uh, everything doesn't happen with a helicopter. Things happen with helicopters on days like this. Uh, Ian was making the comment that, of course, the, the issue, as you've seen for the Loch Arbor boys, is they tend to, I mean, Chris has got these boots here, but he wouldn't obviously use them um, because most of the time he's able to operate wearing slippers because he spends so much time in helicopters. But other teams sometimes have to get out of them. And uh, as he was also saying, sometimes these helicopters break down and uh, the only good thing about helicopters breaking down is that you rescue the crew and the crew are then eternally grateful to you. We also do uh, a, a bit of scooting around where, where we are. Um, you can actually get into the quarries in a good winter within about 25 minutes uh, with a, a slide from the ski area. So if you've got people who are in the patrol, it's actually pretty handy. And, uh, we're finding that um, we don't race it, but we actually beat the helicopter quite often now, uh, getting oxygen to people who've got head injuries and stuff like that, just because you can wing in with the, uh, the stretcher. And we're also using more and different vehicles, so uh, we've got the uh, likes of the skidoos, um, but also the uh, um, uh, ATVs, etc. But the main thing that you've got to bear in mind is none of that works out well when the weather's crap. 
and most of the time when we're actually out and if it's a big job that you remember the weather's crap so you're going to end up on one of these stretchers just just so you know if you get up to about 70 mile an hour 80 mile an hour of uh, wind hauling one of these things they can actually flip up and uh, i have actually seen one on one occasion flying behind us where it was just getting caught by the wind if not you carry it on your back which is a bit like putting a hang glider on your back and then everyone gets to laugh as you get blown back down the hill so I want to say a little bit about avalanches um, and just a little bit about burial versus trauma. I, I, I realise you're doctors, I'm not, by the way, I'm just what you call an enthusiastic amateur. Um, but I get to play with people who've got absolutely no choice about it at all. And uh, whereas I think you've got to get consent and everything, haven't you? So um, what, uh, what I want to do is just cover a little bit about this. First thing about it is, uh, there was mention of dogs. Um, I often get myself in trouble referencing dogs. Dogs are great for certain things, they're not great for everything. And uh, if a dog has got a face like that where it's been getting uh, blasted by uh, um, uh, ice particles on the, the Kelbone Plateau, for example, it's not going to be finding an awful lot. So you've got to be careful that the way you use dogs is exactly where you're going to get best results out of them. Um, in terms of avalanches, I, I took this shot, you can see from the ski area, um, this, this is my um, Darwinian uh, avalanche. Uh, the guy at the bottom who's standing next to the other guy, the, um, one guy shouting at the other guy for burying his rucksack and this is because the guy was standing on the edge of a cornice hitting it with a stick um, saying that it was perfectly solid that was when it went and then took out the slope so you get people doing some pretty stupid things this is a huge avalanche that took place in the uh, northern quarries uh, you can see by the, the wee people that are dotting about there's some really big blocks here some of the blocks of ice are the size of minis and uh, what happened here is that the, uh, the airborne avalanche smashed into the quarry, uh, smashed down into the lochan, and it actually replaced the lochan. So all of the ice from the lochan was blasted out. It was absolutely enormous. And unfortunately for two uh, Lakeland lads who set this one off, they were in it, uh, and it took us a long time before we got them. We also had some pretty serious ones uh, last year. So one of the things that I just, if you didn't know, is uh, try and give you something that might be vaguely interesting on it is that. Um, you can see in these two pictures that the bottom of this uh, this narrow defile has actually been raised. And the reason for that is that we have what we call terrain traps. So sometimes an avalanche might not be that much snow, but if it's in a confined area, it actually builds up and people get badly buried. In this case, you've got a meter and a half head wall that broke. Um, so that's what we call a crown wall. You can see where it went. Um, and uh, the folk were buried very deep uh, and they didn't make it. However, most of the avalanches that we deal with are actually to do with trauma. Um, so it's not so much that you actually get buried by the avalanche and asphyxiated, but that you end up getting uh, swept by the avalanche and bashing into stuff. Uh, this is one from about uh, 2000. Um, and you can see already the influence of the, uh, the bold BT here, because uh, what we've got is, see this here? So you would have thought that colonic irrigation on the side of the hill wasn't totally necessary, but apparently, according to BT, a clean colon is a happy colon, so it's just what you've got to do. You can also see the dog is looking very worried because he wonders when this is going to get applied to him. <laughs> and interestingly, this is absolutely true, this guy here is the officer who led uh, all nine squaddies onto a clearly uh, avalanche-prone slope. And he was trying to work out where his career was going because at the moment it was going to hell in a handcart. And in a moment of genius, he decided the dog would become the hero. And this dog apparently saved all these people. These guys, including myself there, actually did nothing. It was the dog. The dog apparently saved them all. And the dog became the regimental mascot and his career was, uh, was saved. So there's a good side to all avalanches. Also, I wanted to just say a little bit about hypothermia. Um, we do a lot of stuff to do with hypothermia. We don't record it as well as we should. Pretty well any patient that you get on the side of the hill is going to be hypothermic. This guy had decided to go for a walk um, with a storm that had been forecast for about a week. Uh, and uh, the guys in the purple in the back are the background of the Cairngorm team. Uh, the other guys trying to take the glory there, the Braemar team. Uh, the guys in the purple had come across the plateau and the strongest gust we got that day was 137 miles an hour which is why the Kelgon team are not fat, just so we're clear. It's just we're trying to lower our centre of gravity so we can cope with these kind of winds. Um, and uh, this guy was uh, pretty beat up cold-wise, uh, and uh, 
one of the things we've been doing a lot of is, is starting to try and mobilise people and warm them by walking them out because the second you start putting them on a stretcher it gets pretty hard to move them. So just want to say a couple of things from uh, just finish off that BT's always been uh, going on about. So uh, we've talked a lot in Main Rescue about the basics done well and uh, and the fact that although I'm I'm in the unfortunate position in my team that uh, we've actually got five doctors. Many teams are lucky and they have considerably less than that. But um, uh, what uh, what we need to bear in mind is, and I, I thank Christ I've got no nurses at all, it's brilliant. Um, but, but one of the things is keeping things really basic so you can understand them and keep the things that you can do in bad weather. So, uh, so the first key thing is uh, the absolute best airway adjunct for uh, an avalanche situation is actually this. It's a shovel and somebody who's operating it. Um, until you've got a casualty, you ain't got nothing. And you've got to get the casualty out. And we've done a lot of work around things like what we call uh, strategic shoveling. I know it sounds a bit farcical, but the idea that you, you go fast, you're in a V formation, you're hammering the snow out, and uh, you can shift a hell of a lot of snow because you need to get people out as quick as you can. Um, the second thing is that, um, that a live mountaineer with a packet of elastoplast is a damn sight more useful than a dead medic with a shitload of stuff. And uh, so the thing that you actually have to have is people that are going to stay alive with you and not become the next casualty. And so that's really about being able to operate in bad weather, being able to navigate. It's not about technical climbing skills as much as it is about understanding things like snow and uh, not turning yourself into another casualty. So really important for us is that, uh, that we try and skill up the guys we've got. And if we've got doctors who are climbers, that's absolutely great. But what we don't want is doctors who aren't actually competent on the hill. No disrespect to anyone, but that way things can go wrong. Uh, incidentally, that's why you saw BT being hauled off really quickly in that video. You get short of doctors as quick as you can. And then the, uh, the, the final thing is, um, is uh, again, one of the lines that BT would be taking, which is that uh, you, uh, you concentrate on what you can do, which is to stabilise, you manage what you can, and then basically get people out of there that are in a hostile <coughs> environment. Now, in a nice shot like this, where you've got uh, Chunky, who's uh, was he, uh, MBE, DCO, to, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it, they actually have to use a stronger winch line to carry his medals. And, uh, in this sort of situation, it's really nice, isn't it? Because somebody's got hurt, this guy's got a broken back, um, and he just gets his ass hold off really quickly. He's in Raid Mort, which isn't the Belford. It's like the Belford, just not quite as good. And uh, he, he gets taken over there, and, uh, and everything's good. Um, but usually what you're dealing with is this kind of situation. And actually what you're offering people is a bit of shelter and a route out. And a lot of the fancy schmancy stuff, it, it just isn't going to happen in this kind of environment. So keeping it really simple and, uh, and get people out of there. So uh, I'll leave you a final little homage to uh, our friends in the, uh, the RAF. They have, uh, they have ceased to work with us now. Um, this is the classic sort of situation uh, everyone thinks of as a mountain rescue kind of environment. A big yellow helicopter arriving, a member of the Kiongorn team asleep on the stretcher when they should be paying attention. But the main thing is, is that actually, as Chris was saying, everyone needs to work together to, to be able to achieve what we do. So thanks very much for listening, and um, that's a wee bit of a rescue. Thank you. Right, um, follow that, okay. So I thought I'd just uh, put together a few of the things that we've already alluded to and talk about a practical approach to what one can actually do on a hill. And uh, what one can do on a hill is quite a lot, but it's quite a lot of the extreme basics. Belfort Hospital, as we've said, has long been associated with mountain medicine. And mountain emergencies come down to this. This is a prevailing weather, because the weather causes most of our problems. People get lost in it, it snows on them. They don't realize slopes are gonna avalanche. There's the geographic effects on routine emergencies. You can walk just half a kilometer or even less from the main road, break your leg, and you might as well be in Alaska in the back end of beyond. If no one knows you're there, it's a problem. So geography has a massive effect. The activities undertaken, which are more and more in the outdoors now. Plant poisoning, that's good, because it does actually happen. That's a nice plant, I'll eat that. So 
So I've had about four of those over the years. Um, usually water hemlock, which is not particularly good. Uh, it looks a bit like a carrot. Don't try it. <laughs> Snake bite. Well, we don't have black mambas, but we do have the adder in various parts of Scotland. It gets angry. It's been angry this year. Um, certainly on the other side of the lock here, there's quite a few of the things. And they do tend to bite people. Um, blokes get bitten on the hand. It's quite interesting. And ladies only get bitten on the ankle. And that's because of the etc. Let's go and pick it up. The lady is not so stupid. Unusual infections. Yes, you can get anything in the hills. And uh, Lyme and Borreliosis is around La Carba. And we get quite a lot of that. So what does the weather do to you? Hypothermia, clearly. Frostbite. Heat stroke and lightning strike. All of which have occurred in this area in the last three years. That's a big country, isn't it, out there? Just as we looked for the fisher field forests in the north of the country here, but big and wild, as wild as anything anywhere. So what's the principle of rescue? First of all, you've got to locate somebody, because if you don't find them, you can't rescue them. Having located them, you have to access them. Having accessed them, you have to stabilize them, and you can't really tie an intensive care unit with you in your bag. You can carry what you need, and then hopefully you get people like Simon to carry everything else, because you've got to be useful for something. <laughs> and they bring up the stuff together, and together we uh, do the rescue, and then the transfer. So if your principles are location, where am I going to look? How am I going to find you? And you've got to realize that each resource has its own sensitivity. Dog teams, who always put them in? I can't remember a dog finding anything in Scotland, actually. Uh, you do, yeah. One. Oh, trackers. The Americans use trackers quite a lot in Volum. We don't tend to do that. Um, climbers. Yeah, occasionally need them, but interestingly enough, most casualties are at the bottom of the cliff. So you don't actually really require too many climbers. Aircraft, they're useful. I accept when it's raining, snowing, or windy, in which case that in La Carba would be, can't use them 265 days of the year. Water responders. Got to put them in because you get a wee certificate for doing water response these days, don't you? Yeah. And then attraction devices. Help! Access. You've got to evaluate the hazards to your rescuers. You've got to formulate a plan. What the hell am I going to do? And then you've got to resource your plan. And that's what team leaders are for. They're for sitting down in the caravan, formulating the plan, and getting the resources together. Stabilisation, like here in the back of the Devil's Ridge, depends really upon the physical hazards. You can see that on parts of that ridge it might be a little bit difficult to do your log roll and do all the other things that you have to do, but you do have to do it. You do a primary or secondary survey with particular regard to the airway, you ensure adequate immobilisation, and then you work out how you're going to get out of there. I put you have to have particular regard to patients' emotional needs, and that comes through a bit of mountain rescue banter. Um, and it also comes with just holding somebody's hand occasionally. We don't like to say this, but you know you do actually have to be nice to people because they're very emotional. And once they get rescued, you do have to talk to them and keep talking to them all the way off the hill. It's lonely in a stretcher, all wrapped up. It's even lonelier being winched into a helicopter or going down a sheer slope. And there's the methods of transport. The RAF, who we love. No picture of Bristol, I'm afraid. And then there's nice ways of getting people out across rivers and various ways like that. And there's the plug, because if you see a box that's crying out for money, you probably need to put some in it to alleviate your souls. The old Belford Hospital, 1865. Didn't do much mountain rescues, but the earliest rescues around here are probably occurring at that stage. I said earlier, probably done by shepherds and the wise people whose job was on the hill, picking up clowns of climbers. Mr. Duff, with the famous photo of him at Poldew Crag back in the 1940s. The Duff stretcher, which was the basis of mountain rescue and still is. The one we use today, the McInnes Mark VI, is a Duff stretcher with a few more skids along the bottom of it that comes down the snow better. But, uh, the way we used to get people down off Ben Nevis, donkeys years ago, that railway's long since gone. They used to go off to Loch Traig on the other side of La Carba and carry aluminium. A typical team photo. The hats have changed with the years, as well as the yellow coats. 
and that's an old Wessex whirlwind at the top there, so I reckon this is about the 1960s. Then we come into the Wessex 5, the first helicopter I ever flew in with, uh, with the Navy long ago. And that was an amazing piece of kit that could move on a circle, just round and round and round, without, without bothering, it didn't move any far at all. Trouble was it's impossible to get into. That's a wonderful thing, that's a trapped vehicle. We've just gone back into those now. Um, that one was rescued about 40 times and I think it successfully got someone off the hill once. <laughs> it tended to uh, go into ditches, turn upside down. Um, yeah, it was all good fun. We're looking forward to that with the new one. And that is a seeking. The day that came and replaced the Wessex 5, life got very much better. It could carry more people into harder places. And when you saw that thing coming to pick you up, you were extremely happy. So this is ways of getting people off hills. A double strop done there. That's a way of getting somebody off a hill on the bend. It's a long way down. There's another 300 meters below that to actually get that stretcher down, but there's no other way of doing it. That's the same Burak which Mr. Stirrup was in over there. But actually, he tells a lie because it's a very efficient Burak. He's on the left putting in the Venflon, but the chap in the middle here who uh, has gone to the dark side and become a coast guard in the recent past, he is just an ordinary punter who tries to do his best for folk. And he's opening the ampule. He's got his casualty care certificate, so he can actually give morphine under the home office license that I have. And basically, he's getting the ampule ready to give to Chris. So it's all teamwork working together for the appropriate end, which is getting a casualty safely off a hill. And all rescues should be like this on a nice fine day at the Glenfinnan Monument or several metres where it's got a, a view with a drop, which people tend to drop off. And this fellow's broken his leg, the ambulance service have got there, so they require the oxygen for their asthma at that sort of stage. The casualty doesn't require it. And poor chap bending over at the front there is having his um, weekly heart attack. <laughs> and unfortunately, we, we go to sad things. This one's from a very long time ago. A very long time ago very long time ago. So it does happen in the Scottish hills, but hopefully we get people off the hill and we get them off in one piece, either like this one with old fashioned, really heavy oxygen cylinders or with the more modern ones, which are a bit lighter. So we give people two to carry because we're kind like that instead of one, which would be light. We pump up stretchers and we pump up mattresses like that one there, vacuum mattress. And as you can see from all the kit here, all that has to go up a hill. And the only one who can carry it up there is a team member. So we need people who can walk. We need people who can carry things. Hopefully you see a helicopter like that one in the distance and call it in with some smoke. Get your casualty down to the helicopter. Have a handover so that you've got that chain of information going back to the hospital. Your practice. You have a nice team photo on a happy night on Ben Nevis. And you pick up people like that who require extensive treatment for his frostbite, which happens in the Ben, in the Belford. Basically, the, uh, you see in the middle at the top there a thing called a bear hugger, which you probably all come across. We, we warm up very, very cold people with that. You, this fellow went out for a walk in Glencoe, and uh, it's a friendly place, Glencoe, because essentially, he had a pack -a on and he was uh, several hundred metres up a mountain coming near a mountain hut and was denied entry by the people in the hut who said um, go away and was found a day later wandering around so that was very friendly but we did loss for him the hand up there on the right at the top that basically is pretty unviable we use prostacycline on this one in the hospital because little hospitals can do clever things and at that stage we had a we had a license and in the end of the day the picture at the bottom he just lost the top of two little fingertips so you can do some lots of things in your partnership with your mountain rescue team in your local hospital you don't always need to go to the super center that don't know anything about frostbite and probably couldn't warm him up so what's the rescuer principle 
whatever you do, do it well, don't make matters worse. So, what's possible up a hill? There's professional limitations, there's the medical or professional experience of your rescuer, there's on-the-job training, lift that, pull that, training to be a casualty carer, which is our certificate, first aid, first aid is terribly important, one of the finest rescues I ever saw was actually done by a medical student in Green Gully on Ben Nevis, who came across someone who wasn't breathing particularly well, having smashed his jaw, and all he did was hold him for five hours with a finger under the jaw, and the guy survived. Limitations of common sense. If you don't think you should do it, you probably oughtn't to be doing it. And the limitations of the terrain on which you find yourself. It's very difficult to intubate someone upside down in a gully. Just keep his airway open as the fellow did in the green gully. Practice. Make sure everybody knows what they're doing. Make sure the roles are interchangeable. Forge the links with your local hospital. Keep it simple. And don't leave your personal comfort zone because it's not a good place to be on a mountain. A mountain isn't the place to find you can't open an ampule for the first time. Digging. There's a great skill. The comfort zone. You need situational awareness. What can I realistically do here now? You need to think on your feet. Look after yourself. There's no point having a dead rescuer. And then you have to think about your medical procedural things, as I've said. There's a typical scene. You have some folk there at the bottom of the famous Point Five Gully, which is a must-do climb for climbers at some stage in your life, but wait till it's in condition before you do it, if you're thinking of doing it. And you see the little huddle of people at the bottom there. So if you fall off and you're stuck in that gully, how do we get you off? That's where you want to be, getting ready to go, that's where you want to be. You can do things, but dig a trench first. If you can't dig a trench, problems. And there goes a helicopter flying a patient away. And that's a kind of typical scene on Ben Nevis on a winter rescue. And what you can see in front of you as you're going up and down the hill. That's a typical scene at the bottom in which no helicopter is going to fly in there to pick you up. So you're going across those rocks, dragging the guy brings home another lesson. We all know that severely cold people shouldn't be bumped around because they go into ventricular fibrillation, don't they? And then they go asystolic. Unfortunately, how do you get him across there without bumping him around? So it's a paradox. You can't actually wait for ages. You've got to get him out. you just got to do it to the best of your ability. Try and insulate him, try and pack him up and get him across that ground and away. There is one of our scenes of avalanche on the bend into an area at the bottom called the gulches. And there is an avalanche occurring in Glencoe's territory just a few years ago. And I uh, see a short fat doctor walking up the hill there, which is what you need them for. Hopefully not to declare people dead, because that's not why we go up there. We go up there to try and do our best to keep people alive. And it's often a triumph of hope over experience, but that's what you need to do. And that is a very, very bad avalanche scene again in Glencoe. And you can see that we're digging large trenches. There's no hope of finding someone alive from that. This is the second day of the search. And basically, it's getting people home to their relatives. And that sort of pastoral care is an important thing to do. And I've seen some really humanitarian things done by my colleagues, taking relatives to scenes where their loved ones have died. Much, you know and that's been done very quietly. You never hear about these things, but that's what folk in mountain rescue teams actually do. There's a lot of post-traumatic stress for people who actually have mountain injuries, and again, sometimes it's important just to take them aside and talk to them, and we provide networks that uh, are there for that. That's the bottom of the chap's boot. These people are standing up, so avalanches can be disastrous big things in Scotland. It's not a phenomenon of the Alps alone. And that boot, he's actually going down from there. So he's six foot two, so he's about 18 foot down. So where do you go after that? You hear about retrieval to your mega center, put people on ECMO for the hypothermia. 
Well, you really want to go to somewhere that knows what it's doing. So your local hospital may be the answer, but a clear decision can be made and facilitated movement of your patient to a place where they can be seated. We can measure potassium. That's brilliant, because if your potassium is 20, you're not going to do very well on the ECMO. So if we can measure your potassium, then we don't put people to any massive problems. Very cold people, we know, need ECMO. You've got to get them to that. In Scotland, we only have Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and Paediatric ECMO in Glasgow. So how do I get somebody from 0.5 gully there who needs ECMO to ECMO? We do it by talking to people. And we need to know that they're going to actually do okay when they get there, that there's a fair chance. Because if I uh, close down Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, which was done in the Charlemagne Gap, uh, when two people were avalanched, one a doctor, rest in peace, and basically we closed cardiac surgery for the afternoon to get two people across there. Now, that's five people waiting for their bypasses that probably didn't get them that day, and maybe one of those might die. So it's incumbent on us to make sure that we get the right person to the right place at the right time. So that's a lot of decision making for lay people and doctors on hillsides. So we help as much as we can through education and being available. We negotiate at national level ways of taking people. We use the Air Rescue Coordination Centre. We use the Emergency Retrieval Service sometimes. We develop consensus guidelines. I don't like guidelines, but you know, if I wrote it, it's good. We do a tabletop exercise with stakeholders from time to time, but we rely on trust. We need people to trust that those decisions are being taken by the very professional volunteers of Mountain Rescue Scotland. And we trust that their judgment is right. And a team leader who thinks you're viable, you're probably viable, so listen. It's good to talk. We have lots of communication. And we have a list of names of those who can call the incident and actually shut down surgery in a mega centre such as Aberdeen. And we we know who they are, shall we say. Minimum data set, if you come across a casualty in the mountains, you're all aware of IFE and exact location, type of instance, hazards, access, numbers of people involved and the equipment I need. If you're not, you should be. You can use methane or you can use something else if it's a major incident. Very important because information is what you need because you need to know the right kit to take up the hill. So information must be handed over. Remember, airways are important things. In avalanches, we look for air pockets. If we have someone who doesn't know if you've got an air pocket, then it's all finished. Can't really go for ECMO because no air pocket means inviolable. So important when you've got all those people in Chris's Burak with big crampons on stamping around. You have to be a bit of a bully to get in there first and see if your victim has actually got an air pocket because then you can bring in this move to ECMO and spend £100,000 just like that, but I would rely on any team leader or experienced rescuer to tell me that. We found when we did the casualty care that simple things were missing, that rescuers couldn't feel a pulse anymore, they all can now. So we examine basic skills and we make sure they're done at a high level of efficiency by our folk. How do you stay out of court if you're a mountain rescuer? make friends with your hospital, logbook things, obtain consent where possible. Uh, it is important to do that if you can. If I'm going to move you now, there's a 2% chance you might be dead, but if I don't move you now, you will be dead. Spinal injury, there's a 2% chance when you move anyone with a spinal injury without putting them through a log roll that they're going to have a further injury but if the weather's coming in, it's going to take 10 hours to get you off the mountain, then the decision has to be, OK, we've got to take you now in that helicopter rather than wait. Uh, but it's, it's the patient's risk, not yours. So if you can take a quick consent, try it. But uh, if not, you have to make the big boy decisions. Make some notes afterwards. Don't go out of your comfort zone. And uh, if you're relying on necessity as your excuse for staying out of court, make sure you're right. Best advice I was ever given by an orthopaedic surgeon on dislocated uh, shoulders in the hillsides is always find a little patch of decreased sensation there before you pull it.
<laughs> and this is what one tends to do. One tends to be in situations like this on riversides. You have this comic capers on Hannah Moore. I love that picture. It's so sad, that little helicopter can't do what it's meant to do. So sad. But, you know, it's always sun shining here. And the snow's always like that. OK? So, uh, hello everybody. I'm very grateful to your early attendance. So there's uh, two reminders of who I am, one on the screen and one around my neck. Uh, I'm Chris Ellis, I'm a GP in Kinnochleave and I'm one of three GPs there. You've already heard from the other two. Uh, I've been there since the year 2000 and as well as uh, doing the day job, uh, I also wear a number of hats and it's those hats I'm going to speak to you about today. So uh, my brief here is uh, to convey my multi-hat portfolio uh, uh, within this field of sports medicine discuss the interactions uh, uh, between the wearing of those hats uh, and my colleagues in secondary care. And if I can tell you something of interest and use at the same time, well, that's a bonus. So the first of those hats is of a uh, doctor in the Glencoe uh, Mountain Rescue Team. Uh, but you've heard a great deal about mountain rescue, uh, so I think I'll move quickly through that uh, uh, and only say how when you're out on the hill in difficult conditions, uh, with a, a, a severely injured patient, how reassuring it is to be able to use uh, modern communication techniques to speak to the colleagues with whom you work on a daily basis uh, uh, and uh, get advice. And then should you travel with your casualty uh, to that hospital, you can speak to that same colleague. And finally, when the dust has settled on the incident, you can have a, a constructive debrief. Uh, and the fourth advantage of dealing with your local hospital is that when several thousand pounds worth of kit goes to it with your casualty, uh, you stand some chance of getting it back, because the same can't be said uh, if patients go to, to Glasgow. So the second of my hats is, is that of medical officer at the uh, annual uh, Mountain Bike World Cup, and I've done that for the last uh, uh, six or seven years since I took over from Dr. Douglas's daughter uh, uh, until this year when I handed over to uh, Neil Wright. So for three days of the year, probably the biggest, uh, uh, biggest event in Loch Arbor uh, happens. Uh, every uh, uh, accommodation bed, all 12,000 in Loch Arbor are taken uh, by the participants and spectators in this event. Uh, and uh, the deal is that uh, out of a, a specially erected tent uh, with no running water, uh, you, uh, you are the kind of focal point of what is brought down uh, uh, from, from the hill. I see stirrup gets into everything. Um, so uh, um, at the start of the first day, I'll call in at the A&E department and pick up a pile of scrubbing brushes, suture packs and x-ray forms. Uh, and then at the end of each day, I can call by at, uh, at, uh, in the same A&E department and get some feedback of the casualties that I've sent in. So the types of casualties you see, well, at the minor end of the spectrum, we've got cuts and grazes that we suture or scrub. Uh, uh, that's that middle picture there. That's not a dislocated uh, uh, carpal. That's a pebble. Uh, and we can fish them out. Uh, and we see a whole gamut of, uh, of uh, upper limb injuries Scaphoid fractures are two, uh, two a penny, uh, clavicle fractures, uh, uh, dislocated acromioclavicular joints, they, they are new, uh, frequent, and dislocated shoulders, not infrequent. At the other end of the spectrum, see your head and spinal injuries, uh, uh, lower limb injuries, and had a couple of uh, hip dislocations, uh, and then visceral injuries. Uh, and I can recall uh, at least one ruptured spleen, one ruptured kidney, and one ruptured bowel. And it's actually those injuries uh, in, in performing the medical officer role that tax me the most. Because a casualty that's had a mountain bike accident, uh, that's landed on his abdomen on the handlebars, saddle, or a rock, uh, brought swiftly into the medical tent, 
can be in a great deal of uh, abdominal pain from either an ab uh, abdominal wall injury or a visceral injury and uh, with the complication of a lot of adrenaline on board and uh, athletic physiology I find it really difficult to make my mind up as to whether it's simply a muscular injury or there's something more significant going on below. And I have no solution to that dilemma other than to uh, highlight it and, and urge caution. The next of my hats is that of uh, medical officer to the West Highland Way race, uh, which I've been for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, so I'm the only possessor uh, of a finisher's goblet who's never actually run it. Um, so that's a 96 mile track uh, between Glasgow and Fort William, usually a field of around 200 and you've got 35 hours uh, to complete. So that, that event does not benefit from the resources of the, um, of the uh, big city uh, uh, marathons uh, and in fact the only doctor uh, at the event is generally me uh, and I base myself in Kinlochleven first of all because that's my home uh, and secondly because uh, at the end of the race it's within a few hundred yards of the hospital so there is medical, medical resources there. And then thirdly, that uh, for reasons that I hope you're about to understand, that the likelihood of running into difficulty increases uh, as you get towards the end of the race. But we have made some uh, inroads into uh, making the event safer. Uh, there's now quite a substantial medical uh, uh, element to the race website. Uh, there's an educational uh, evening held every year and uh, we've introduced routine weighing at start and end at uh, four points along the way uh, and uh, contrary to what you might think uh, the reason for the introduction of weighing is to detect the more worrying weight gain uh, rather than the much less worrying weight loss. So there's uh, no shortage of literature on, on uh, disorders of, of, uh, of extreme exertion and I've been lucky enough to, to uh, be involved in a couple of publications off the back of, uh, on the back, off the back of my involvement with the West Highland Way race. Uh, I can't say that either of those uh, added to the, to the knowledge, uh, but they did uh, um, demonstrate that what is reported in uh, more established events elsewhere also happens in the West Highland Way race. So, uh, with regards to what you might encounter, well, if you're unlucky, and uh, so far I haven't been, sudden death. Uh, and if you encounter sudden death, then the most likely basis of that would be cardiac. Uh, and of the cardiac causes, they can uh, uh, broadly be divided into uh, those of the over 35, which most likely would be due to ischemic heart disease. And those under 35, which would be more likely due to some uh, congenital defect of, uh, of, uh, of heart muscle, uh, cardiomyopathy, or of rhythm, uh, an ion channelopathy. There's a gamut of physiological disorders, and it's as well to be aware of that uh, so that you can avoid uh, unnecessary anxiety for yourself and your patient uh, and unnecessary uh, treatments. And I'm going to speak uh, individually about some of those. And then there's some specific pathological entities. So uh, what do doesn't feature on that list is, is two things. First of all, uh, if you go to the great god of, of uh, disorders of prolonged exertion, uh, Tim Noakes in Cape Town, he'll, he's quite categorical that heat exhaustion doesn't exist, uh, and uh, I wouldn't argue with him. And then with re regard to dehydration, well, it, it rarely applies, uh, but he's even more rarely the explanation for the problem that you've got in front of you. So I would uh, advise not to make the diagnosis of heat exhaustion and to think very hard about the diagnosis of dehydration. So by far and away the commonest physiological entity you'll encounter if you uh, deal with uh, uh, extreme sports events is this beastly exercise associated postural hypertension. It's extremely common, it's often not recognized for what it is and what a meal is made of it uh, completely unnecessarily. So the presentation is generally uh, very straightforward, that a completely well runner finishes the race, celebrates, uh, stands about, and with, within one to a small number of minutes is, is flat on the ground. Um, and uh, in that typical scenario, all that's required is to leave them as they are, or put them in, in the Trendelenburg position, uh, and within five to 20 minutes, uh, they will come good. Uh, they tend to be people who do that uh, uh, repeatedly, so they often know who they are. Okay. So with regard to collapse, there's a rule of thumb whereby uh, with that typical story, uh, collapse 
shortly after finishing an event, then you're fairly safe to say that that's exercise associated postural hypertension uh, until uh, um, postural hypertension and if they're otherwise symptom free. If they collapse while they're running, that's completely different and that's generally sinister and warrants a medical assessment. I omitted to just tell you the, uh, the physiology underlying this form of collapse. It's very straightforward that on stopping running, the muscle pump uh, uh, promoting venous return is abruptly discontinued. So there is no venous return. If there's no venous return, there's no cardiac output and over you go. So here's another uh, uh, physiological entity uh, uh, reported by Byrne in uh, 2006 uh, when he, ad he administered, uh, ingested uh, temperature measuring uh, capsules to runners in the Singapore Half Marathon. And as you can see, there was universal elevation in core temperature, with some of them achieving temperatures which we might otherwise think worrying. So bear in mind that these people are, are completely otherwise well, and therefore you, you don't have to worry that they've got any uh, significant heat injury. But it would make it difficult if you found a temperature uh, above 40 degrees in someone who was reporting uh, other symptoms of, of lack of well-being. So it's as, as well to be aware of the uh, physiological nature of, of uh, elevated core temperature, but also that not every raised uh, core temperature is innocent. Uh, so if you understand how uh, those temperature readings are obtained following the ingestion of the temperature sensitive capsule, you'll appreciate how uh, I can't repeat those studies uh, over the duration of the West Highland Way race and that uh, recordings would come to an abrupt end, uh, usually uh, after the first night. So here's another uh, physiological uh, beastie uh, whereby we measured uh, the the creatinine kinase levels of 67 healthy finishes in 2009. And as you can see, there is universal elevation uh, of creatinine kinase. What's quite striking is the spread of, of, uh, uh, of readings between 1100 at uh, the lowest level and 132,000 at the highest. And uh, I can't really offer a good explanation why that is. But in the absence of other symptoms, uh, uh, an isolated elevation of creatinine kinase uh, need be no concern. So if we move on to the pathological entities, well, here's one that's uh, quite specific to uh, uh, prolonged endurance, and uh, it, it generates a consensus uh, panel on which uh, Brian doesn't sit, but nevertheless, I think uh, its findings and recommendations are valid, uh, but they're quite uh, 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 convoluted. Uh, and here's a, here's a summary of the state of play with regard to exercise-associated hypomanitremia. So, uh, for reasons that uh, time may permit me to go into, it's much more common in the United States. Uh, I became aware of four cases in the West Highland Way race in 2005, from, from which my involvement generated, and we haven't had a case since. If you're going to uh, be involved in these events and, and uh, deal with this phenomenon, it's critical in order to be safe that you understand why it happens. And the basis of it is that um, the influence of stress uh, and prolonged exertion you generate a physiologically inappropriate raised ADH uh, and in the context of excessive fluid intake which often tends to be the slower runners who drink according to the clock or by the availability of water stations uh, become fluid overloaded. So the symptoms of EAH reflect that of the uh, associated cerebral edema and you progress through confusion, uh, seizures, uh, uh, so a coma and if you're unlucky death. And clearly uh, the diagnosis is confirmed by the measurement of the, of the sodium and the finding that the level is below the lower limit of the laboratory. Although most of the profoundly symptomatic people generally have sodium below 130. So the management of this, this condition involves fluid restriction or the administration of hypertonic saline. And uh, um, those of you who work in AUNE will know that at the time of this race each year we check that that is available uh, both to, to you in the AUNE department uh, and uh, to me in Kinnock Leaven. Uh, and as I said, uh, despite the high incidences that are reported from the United States, I have never seen a case of this in, in the last 10 years. But I would, if uh, need be, in a patient who followed those uh, diagnostic criteria, uh, be prepared to, to implement the consensus guidance, which is the administration of 100 mils of uh, hypertonic saline uh, over 10 minutes in the field without any knowledge of the electrolytes. But that is as much as I'd be allowed to give. Hopefully the conscious level or the seizures would improve and any further uh, um, 
any further uh, administrations uh, need to be done under uh, the, the under more intensive facilities where electrolyte measurement is available. So if you understand uh, what's going on with exercise associated hyponatremia, you'll appreciate why I've put that uh, very major caution at the bottom, whereby if you uh, uh, encounter these people and uh, implement a, a brisk and blind intravenous infusion, you run the risk of making uh, any cerebral edema worse and indeed of killing the patient. The next pathological entity that, uh, that we've seen three of is uh, of acute kidney, kidney injury. Um, so those are, those are two cases, uh, in which, neither of which was I involved with personally. Uh, athlete one uh, didn't appreciate how well he was until 24 hours after the race, by which time he was at his home in Glasgow and uh, sought medical input down there. Uh, athlete two withdrew from the race uh, after just uh, just over 20 hours, uh, came initially to the Belford where the immediate challenge was the management of his seizures and if you've been listening to the previous slide you probably work out why athlete 2 was fitting uh, and then uh, following that he was transferred to Inverness for the management of his acute uh, kidney injury. Now I've never seen myoglobinuria uh, uh, but I'm aware of its potential. Um, I don't know what the story was with urine output of athlete uh, two, but athlete one was quite clear in the, in the, in the 24 hours between completion of the race and presentation to, in Glasgow, the, his urine output was vastly uh, diminished uh, or even absent and he gained 10 kilos. I'm glad to say both these people responded uh, quickly uh, to uh, conservative management and despite the uh, words of caution about the uh, prognosis for people who've had acute kidney injury uh, from Dr. Peel and his talk on the first day, as far as I'm aware, both these two are completely back to normal. So uh, I'm going to now uh, take a whistle-stop tour through uh, four presentations from the sports injury clinic, which are of a more sub-acute nature, uh, um, <coughs> to, to, to share a few uh, potential learning points with you. So uh, the first injury uh, there, it's, anyone recognize what that is? That's, that's uh, it's diagrams of fracture of the lateral process of the talus, which is almost exclusively the domain of snowboarders. So uh, with regards to the question, when is an ankle sprain not an ankle sprain, I would say to you when it's a snowboarder. It's the clinical findings of, uh, of tenderness are very close uh, to the lateral ligament complex, and you might be lured into a diagnosis of ankle sprain. Uh, but if you consider the mechanism, uh, and, and in this case it won't be an inversion, and the fact that they're a snowboarder, uh, I would urge that you consider this diagnosis, which is a small injury that causes a great deal of bother. So if the injury isn't evident on plain x-ray uh, and, and you suspect it, I would, uh, I would urge that you give uh, thought to CT. Uh, the second uh, injury there uh, is that of the presentation of low back pain in the sporting uh, young adult male often involved in uh, sports where there's repeated back extension such as rowing, fast bowling or javelin throwing uh, and you may wish to consider the diagnosis of a pass intraarticularis stress fracture and its consequences. The third presentation uh, is that of flat foot uh, and uh, I think it behooves any GP to be able to deal with flat foot very summarily. It takes about five seconds to look at the foot and say yes that's flat and in my view it takes 10 seconds to do the job properly whereby you ask the patient to stand on tiptoe and ordinarily an arch will come and you can be reassuring. Should you ask the, the uh, child of between 5 and 10 or any time older than that to, to stand on tiptoe and no arch comes then you're likely dealing with a tarsal coalition. And finally uh, the presentation of a slipped upper femoral epiphysis which is traditionally the domain of the overweight uh, male between 10 and 15 uh, who has a kind of diffuse groin pain and a limp uh, and uh, you've got a short window of opportunity to uh, suspect a uh, slipped epiphysis uh, at an early stage before it comes so slipped that you're in big trouble and ringing your indemnity organisation. Uh, uh, and here is a word of caution from the BNF which some people may not be aware of concerning the uh, incidence of tendon injury or rupture uh, in association with the prescription of quinolones. So in amongst all the other reasons why you might not uh, prescribe a quinolone, uh, here's one more. 
So uh, that's all I've got to say about my uh, various sports medical hats and the uh, and the uh, interaction that they uh, that they generate with my local hospital. Um, uh, we shouldn't forget the occasion which brings us all here this weekend, that the 150th birthday. Uh, but a hospital is only bricks and mortar, and what's much more important is uh, is the uh, large number of friends and colleagues who have worked uh, and uh, with regards to these four and now do work uh, in it, uh, with whom I have contact on a near daily basis, uh, and I uh, and my patients uh, derive a great deal of benefit from that. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, we have an opportunity for some questions, unless you're dying for your coffee already. Um, that was really interesting to hear all about the mountain rescue. I was just wondering how much risk the actual mountain rescuers are at, and if there's been any significant injuries that the actual rescuers have had. Simon, I think you're in the best position to answer that one. Can you hear me okay, yeah? Um, I so there's been uh, there's been a couple of deaths uh, that I'm aware of uh, which have taken place. Um, uh, those have been uh, related to uh, one one's related to a helicopter crash, and another was related to a fall whilst training. Um, uh, main rescue is inherently a bit dangerous, I suppose. Um, uh, somebody once described it to me as a bit like the fire service. You know, when a house is on fire, everyone else is running out, and you're running in. Although, um, as you've seen with people like Chris, it's more kind of wheezing and walking very slowly in. And um, so I think the, the, the main thing with it is, well, you, I've, I've got to say it the way it is, man. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, there are risks, and, and I think the biggest risks that you run, actually, are less the, the kind of really scary stuff. Uh, I, I know I can think of times where I've done some sort of fairly wild things, um, sort of at night, soaring around tops of roots and stuff like that. That all looks very gripping, but it's actually, that's not where the big risks are. Uh, the big risks are usually hauling stretches through boulder fields and stuff like that, where you, you pull your knees, you pull your back, etc. That, I think, is the most common injury. And so uh, we do end up with a lot of people who end up with a, a trashed knee or a back or a hip or you go over on your ankle. Um, and also you get blown around a lot. Uh, so. If it's really windy, um, it's really hard to just keep your feet sometimes. So it's that kind of stuff. With that, that makes sort of fair comment about the most likely things that are going to happen to you. Um, and in terms of the the general risk, um, you're pretty reliant on each other. Uh, we're we're all very careful about things like uh, snow conditions. Uh, some of the snow conditions can be really quite quite frightening. Uh, but the bottom line is, if you if you really think it's that bad, then you don't do it. Um, because there's no sense in you adding to the problem by becoming a casualty yourself. Sorry, that was a bit of a rambling answer. But... Hi, David Hogg, GP and uh, team member of Ireland at MRT, so bracing myself for comments. Um, I'm intrigued because we often talk about problems of age and uh, complexity. And I get the impression, I've not seen the figures, but there's more fit to 70, 80 and sometimes even 90 year olds on the hills. Is that changing how we approach uh, training for members and tra training for kind of the casualty care that we experience and perhaps the kit that we need to look at taking up as well? well I think the average age of our team is 70, actually. That's not, yeah. So, uh, as it says, young people should go climbing and the old people should rescue them. I don't think that's ever changed. So, essentially, yeah, I think there are a lot of fit elderly people walking up and down hills. We, we spend a bit of time on the Ben Path escorting off 85-year-olds. But it's um, more than likely they'll get themselves off the hills because they've been doing it all their lives. You know, we had a particular tragedy just a few weeks ago where a chap who, who was such a careful individual, he phoned his wife from the top of the route to say, I'm on my way down now. And he never made it down. You know, he usually phoned her at four o'clock in the afternoon when he got off as well. But he was found in a river nearby. So you know, he was doing what he wanted to do and he died exactly where he wanted to die, I suspect, at the end of the day. If he had a choice, he wouldn't have said no. So um, our job was simply to go and pick him up, as you know yourself. I'm Rosalind, one of the a surgical trainee. I just wanted to ask, you said that there's about £300,000 funding you get. How much do you need to raise 
to keep the mountain rescue teams going each year? Uh, it kind of depends on the individual teams. So uh, the different teams cost different amounts to run depending on their levels of activity, if, if you get what I mean. So, so the funding we get from the Scottish Government is £312,000. That's remained unchanged uh, for the last 15 years. Um, on top of that, the teams will vary. Some will be running at maybe about 50 grand a year to, to be going. I think Lockhart is about 100 grand a year. Uh, uh, but that's because they're very good to themselves. Um, Blinko, like I've said, I mean, they basically eat their socks and tree bark, stuff like that. So, but they're, I think you're about 70, something like that, are you? I think Kilgore's about uh, 80. 50, 55. Aye, aye, so he says. Um, <laughs> but but um, the individual teams just uh, have to raise their own money. And, and to be honest with you, um, they all do it in different ways. So there's a bit about what you could achieve with rattling tins, and then there's a bit about what you can achieve by promoting yourselves and uh, um, uh, we used to do, all teams used to do quite big events so like the Cairngorm team we used to do a big um, sponsored walk and I think the most successful one we had cleared 65,000 but the trouble is there's now so many events that uh, you're, you're in a really crowded marketplace a lot of the events actually uh, cancel off and things so um, uh, you, you just, you have to, yeah, you have to raise probably more than half of your running costs. Well, I'm too pleased to that. Uh, it's no joke that if your kit goes to Glasgow, it never comes back, because that's what happens the entire time. On vacuum mattresses, 450 quid a shot, they never come back. You know, it's got the Carver Mountain Rescue coming all over it. So if you come across one in your hospital, we'll pay the postage. <laughs> it's going to come back to us at some stage. And the other, to put it into perspective, each time we lower someone off the top of Ben Nevis, on a rope, we can't use that rope twice, it costs a thousand pounds for the rope. So that puts it in the perspective for you of what the real costs of rescue are, actually are, and why we have to raise such money charitably. Any, yep, some more, Bill McCarrow, I'll come to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, you hadn't mentioned anything about the Ben Race. Do, does much of your activity arise from that, or is, it, uh, is the safety record exemplary? So I presume that's directed at me, and the honest answer is, I don't know, I've, I've never... <laughs> <laughs> Loch Harbour Mountain Rescue Team cover the Ben Race every year, and have done traditionally, thanks Chris. <laughs> different, different race. Um, aye, the, the racers are prepared for, that they're all athletes, most of them, um, and they're prepared for the race, they, it's quite difficult to get an entry, uh, those of you locally that have tried, no, because there is... Uh, you know, quite quite a rigorous process of entering. You don't just turn up on the day and run it. So the guys there are pretty hill savvy. So we are there um, as a kind of marshalling and safety cover, which um, we've traditionally done and, and hopefully will continue to do for the race. So yeah, the, the injuries are as normal, probably as Chris has seen with mountain biking events and other things. It's all superficial abrasions, the odd limb injury, but most of the guys. You can't stop them anyway, even if you wanted to, they'll carry on running to the bottom because they've got to hand that ticket in as far as they're concerned. So yeah, we don't see much on the hill, we see some stuff in the Belford afterwards, but it's usually all minor. Um, a couple of the talks mentioned uh, upcoming changes, ongoing changes in military service provision. Do you see the move to more civilian and commercial partners flying the helicopters, oh, oh, changing oh, oh. frontline services at all? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Deep joy. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are changes. There's, there's significant changes. Um, the the well, it was really well. It was described to me really well, actually, recently by the chief pilot of Bristol. And I think it's a context you've got maybe to to account. Um, the the military kind of uh, operate on the basis of people shooting at them, and uh, so. The kind of high risk end of their activity is being in places where people have got uh, projectile weapons pointed at you. So the, the, the kind of work they do around search and rescue is actually a le lesser risk end of the, the business, if you get what I mean. Whereas uh, the likes of Bristol's are, are more kind of trash haulers, so they're going to going out to the wrecks and things like that. And then they've got the search and rescue end, and the search and rescue end is actually the, the heavy end of what they do, that's, that's the high risk end. 
Um, so Bristow's are operating as a civilian contractor under uh, CAA rules, um, except for when they're, uh, they're operating in a rescue mission. So for those of you that don't know it, um, when you used to see a Sea King flying around, Sea King was, uh, was, was SK or Sea King 137 um, until it was uh, tasked to a rescue, at which point it became Rescue 137 or 177 or whatever one you're dealing with. So the same exists at the moment. Uh, Coast Guard 951 is uh, flying as a, a Coast Guard helicopter and it's flying to CAA rules. And that means there's a whole load of stuff that we didn't see coming about. Landing sites, um, their ability to fly with uh, the level of power they've got in the engines versus the prevailing wind conditions, uh, visual conditions, etc., etc. I could go on for a long time, Beta. And that applies when they're flying under the CAA rules. Um, however, the second they become Rescue 951, then you're dealing with uh, search and rescue pilots who are flying a, a more capable aircraft. and. Uh, so what, uh, what we're hoping is that they're going to fly in the same way but with a more capable aircraft that the RAF and, and the, the Navy were flying. Um, the, the biggest issue that we've had recently was that it was an expectation they'd be flying with night vision goggles. Um, and uh, night vision capability is really important in mountain flying because it allows you to see the texture of the hill around you. So there was a whole load of fairly flawed assumptions that we were sold which were about um, use of uh, ground radar, use of this big search like they had etc. Um, but what it meant was that um, at, uh, at the likes of midsummer, uh, I was having to walk people across the Cairngorm Plateau because I couldn't get an aircraft in because I couldn't get an aircraft with night vision capability and we saw that as a definite downside. The problem there was that because they're working under CAA rules is that uh, Bristol had to qualify, so they're now the first um, uh, civilian qualified night vision capable asset and uh, they qualified on the 9th of October, not that it was a really important day for me, so they're now flying night vision capable. Many of the pilots are night vision capable ex-RAF, so they've got hundreds of hours, some of them are not. So we're going through a period of change, it's, it's beautifully political this isn't it, I, am I, I playing this right? Thank you. So, um, so yeah, it's a big change and uh, in the end, I think there's two things to bear in mind. One is, I'm kind of hoping that um, Bristol is a part of the same team as us and, and we all do work together. They kind of do their job without us, we kind of do our job without them, so there's no sense in us greeting about it as the way it is. And the second thing is, we've seen some pretty good examples, particularly in the northwest, where uh, we, we had some pretty nasty rescues that have pulled out all the stops, they've done some pretty amazing flying, and they've looked out for us. So. Where I'm at personally is uh, pretty positive at the moment, but it's been quite difficult to get there. And the other thing that's worth bearing in mind is you're not dealing with the, the military now, you're dealing with a, a commercial entity. So uh, the guys that are flying, they're solid gold, but they've also got um, kind of like managers and accountants and stuff like that going on, and they're maybe not the same precious metal. Is that a fair point, guys? Eh? Yeah. Okay, I think we'll call that to an end unless anyone's got a burning question have some coffee and then carry on at uh, about 10 o'clock can we show our traditional uh